The Royal School of Church Music is the internationally renowned charity devoted to the flourishing of church music. We work to support church music and musicians of the present and to build on the great sacred music heritage in the UK and beyond. And we're doing that to create and build a bright future for music and worship for everyone. There are three key things we focus on. Firstly, the school in our title reminds us of the vital importance of education. Our comprehensive plan for developing new and exciting projects and products, especially for young people, is now well underway. Secondly, our membership scheme directly supports choirs in churches and schools with practical guides and suggested music. And finally, we are an advocate for church music, working to unlock the power of music for the well-being of all and to enhance the mission of the church. Hello and welcome to this, the second in this series of RSCM Friday Lunchtime Lectures. My name is Stefan and it gives me great pleasure to be here today with Dr Gillian Warson, who is going to talk to us about the singing of vintage hymns. Gillian is a lecturer, a tutor and a choral director who has published several books, most recently on the subject of using vintage hymns in worship. And her book is available to buy right now on the RSCM's own web shop. And if you look below where I am now, you will see a link which will take you straight to it. Gillian has given conferences, papers in many parts of the world. And as a musician, she also performs with a local semi-professional orchestra and plays in several folk groups. Gillian is going to be speaking for about 45 minutes and then she'll be answering any questions you may have. You can use the YouTube chat feed to tell us where you're joining from and to ask those questions. There's no need to wait until the end. You can add the questions whenever they occur to you, and I will put them to Gillian at the end. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can use the comments in exactly the same way. And finally, before we begin, I would like to remind you that whilst these lectures are free to watch, they do cost us money to put on, and their continuation beyond this series as a free resource really does depend upon your generosity. So please do consider donating to the RSCM in appreciation. We are a charity and in these difficult times, we will not be able to go on producing content free without your generosity. Now, without any further ado, I shall hand over to Gillian. Thank you. young chorister way back when, one of my tasks was to run round to the rectory with my twin sister just before choir practice to collect the hymn numbers. Imagine the scene, two ten-year-olds with their wild 1970s hair trotting down the road to carry out this important job. One day we arrived and oh dear, the rector hadn't had time to make his selection. What on earth should we do? I know, he said, you choose the hymns this week. Deep joy. What should we choose? At that time, I loved the tune Personent Hodie, which we sang to the words, God is love, is the care. This hymn has many delights, including the tantalising possibility that a novice singer might miscount that seven note introduction. We could choose all creatures of our God and King, with its enticing list of nouns and, once more, setting a trap for the unwary singer. Are we going to sing a long alleluia or a short one? More fancifully, perhaps, we could plump for Let All the World in Every Corner Sing, which always made me picture the praises which thither fly, disappearing like a murmuration of birds. Although, of course, I didn't know the word murmuration when I was ten. So many delights. 
My point, though, is not to introduce you to my personal childhood favourites, but to open a discussion regarding the choosing of hymns. Actually, I can't remember which hymns we sung that Sunday, but I'm sure our choir master, Malcolm Hicks, reigned us in. Is it really acceptable, however, simply to fall back on singing favourite hymns Sunday by Sunday? As I consider this careless, indeed slothful approach to selecting hymns, I'm starting to think about the principles on which we should choose. One obvious problem is that we tend to fall back on the same narrow repertoire. Is this a bad thing, I hear you say? Well, in the first place, a slothful approach to picking hymns can lead to a slothful lack of reflection on the text. Perhaps a hymn has been sung so often that over-familiarity lulls us, lulls our capacity to appreciate the words and their real sense. Scarcely the right approach to worship, don't you think? And there's a further, more deep-seated problem, and this concerns so-called vintage hymns. It's all the rage to talk about vintage hymns these days. Indeed, I've recently written a whole book on the subject. Vintage hymns are those that are well known, well loved and form a rich theme in our collective memory. Surely though, this veneration of vintage hymns may seduce us into singing over and over again words that, on reflection, may express sentiments quite other than those we want to express as Christians. Let's start at the beginning and ask ourselves a basic question. Are hymns an important and valuable part of our worship? If they are, which I believe is the case, then they are worth considering carefully and thoughtfully. In his excellent book, Finding Happiness, Abbot Christopher Jameson devotes a chapter to what he considers to be the eighth deadly sin, that of Acadia. I take my pronunciation from Chambers Dictionary. This, he explains, is the, spirit, is the sin of spiritual sloth and carefulness, carelessness. That is, making no coherent attempt to develop an internal life of prayer and closeness to God. Of course, as a monk, Abbot Jameson advocates the practice of Lectio Divina, a method of reading the Bible slowly, chewing over the words and pondering them in silent contemplation. This idea may seem at odds with our weekly romp through delicious texts and tunes, but bear with me and let's see if, how we can think about our hymns with similar depth of reflection. Thomas Aquinas writes that, a hymn is the exaltation of the mind dwelling on eternal things bursting forth in the voice. This offers the perfect point of departure. There are, of course, many and sometimes conflicting ways of defining a hymn. But for, de for today, let's adopt the working definition that it is a sequence of verses that express moral sentiments in accordance with our Christian beliefs. Many hymns include biblical references and stories, but some mention no explicitly sacred characters and places. For example, One More Step Along the World I Go by Sidney Carter is included in many 20th century hymn books, yet has none of the vocabulary we recognise as religious. Why sing it then? Because on reflection, along with countless other hymns, it enshrines moral sentiments such as love of neighbour, promoting peace and avoiding violence, which are central to our Christian lives. After all, we sing hymns in the first place to affirm our faith. There are, though, further reasons why hymns are sung, and these are important when it comes to their careful selection. For many people, singing hymns is part of a shared experience, either in large or small groups, perhaps marking a rite of passage. 
Singing together, whether hymns or any other songs, is a unique experience that can help express a collective response to all manner of situations. From messages of protest speaking out against injustice or hatred, to the chanting of a football crowd, the power of group singing can stir our deepest emotions. So we can see that, as Aquinas suggests, in hymns, we have a blend of text and tune, which gives us the opportunity not only to think about what the words mean, but also to feel the force of the words as conveyed by the music. It is for this reason that our hymns need to be chosen with utmost care, lest we fall into sin. Yes, the sin of Acadia. Why are we slothful when we choose hymns? And do we have any valid excuses? The first excuse is that we may simply feel that the chore of choosing hymns every week does not deserve our full care and attention. A second is that we may fall prey to mechanical adherence to tradition. This tradition might cover the ceremonial aspects of our individual chosen places of worship or embrace the style of ritual we consider essential to maintain the status, status quo for our denominations. And our hymns may feature alongside customs of dress, bells and candles, for example. Of course, we want to choose hymns that support the requirements of liturgy, but there is more to this than working through a list of suitable hymns, as suggested by various hymn choosing tools, including the excellent RSCM publication Sunday by Sunday. I should though pause here to note that other hymn choosing hymns and um, other hymn choosing tools are available. Do we though still insist on choosing our favourite hymns? those we and our congregation know best. Why does this happen? Perhaps the organist will only play from a certain book. Maybe the congregation will complain if we don't have hymns they all recognise. Of course, there are restrictions placed on us by the hymn book that we're using. And what about not having a choir to lead new material? Now let's think about how we can address some of these genuine difficulties that occur as we turn time and time again to vintage hymns. Before that, there's something else to think about. We have all felt the abiding comfort of singing a well-loved vintage hymn. But hold on, who, why should hymn singing be comforting at all? Is the Christian message that we seek only to be found in the familiar? Some people may say that singing familiar hymns is exactly the wrong way to respond to the Christian message. Surely a genuine act of worship should lead us to clear thought and decisive action, not to lull us into unreflective sloth. Such an observation raises a fundamental question about the form Christian worship should take. However, we must leave this debate for another occasion. A lifetime of hymn singing such as mine has naturally led to a repertoire of many favourite hymns. Along with countless other singers, I'm drawn to these and, con and, and am consequently in danger of being blind to any shortcomings in the text. How can I change my mindset, especially when it comes to singing vintage hymns? Vintage hymns could be those remembered from school days when we joined with, in with classmates for a rousing sing. Singing vintage hymns may reflect our denominational preferences as well as our cultural heritage. Whatever the reason for preferring one hymn over another, it is possible that with time, we may find that it has become unsuitable for a number of reasons. Vintage hymns, are by definition old. But at this point in discussion, it's important to note that this does not necessarily mean they are old fashioned or out of date, although it can. Our attitude in something old is powerfully influenced by considering whether it can still perform its original function. We might, for example, throw out an old fashioned washing machine because a new model 
performs the function of washing clothes more efficiently. On the other hand, we may be happy to keep an old chair because it continues to fulfill its original purpose in that it's comfortable to sit on and is attractive. However, and here's the crux of the matter, do we simply keep that old chair or old hymn just because we are so used to seeing it or singing it? In fact, we may hardly even notice it any longer. This is why we need to keep assessing our hymns by singing them with fresh voices to make sure they are worthy of retaining their place as vintage hymns. There are, of course, reasons why a hymn has become vintage in the first place, other than the fact that we simply like it. It may, for example, be couched in especially beautiful language. Perhaps it's significant because of the author's reputation. And there may be important historical or cultural associations connected with it. Furthermore, it may be a striking expression of deep and abiding Christian truths. The responses to these ideas will weigh with us when deciding to add this hymn or that to our collection of favourites and accord these hymns the status of vintage hymns. There still remains a difficulty though. As we continue to sing our favourite hymns, we may cease to pay strict attention to the words themselves and fail to register problems that these words might create. Do we, for example, blithely continue to sing hymns which contain questionable references to the empire and those that even suggest that Britain is superior to other countries? What about those hymns which focus on what may be seen to be the glorification of war or make unwarranted assumptions that it is only men that are uniquely suited to life on the battlefield? Furthermore, there is a thorny question of gender inclusivity, which poses many problems of its own. Not only do many, many older hymns appear to exclude women, others, even those vintage hymns, prized for their rich language and historical importance, express sentiments which some might feel are downright misogynistic. What can we do about these difficulties? One solution is to change or adapt these texts to eliminate these unwanted features. This is a bold and somewhat unpopular solution. We are naturally, of course, disinclined to change things that, with time, have become our old friends. Now the time has come to think about how we are going to resolve at least some of these difficulties. Rather than embark on a wide ranging survey of the shortcomings of every hymn, which would be far too ambitious for a lecture of this length, I shall focus my attention on a few vintage texts, familiar and otherwise, to illustrate my approach. One of my favourite hymns is He Who Would Valiant Be. Oh, wait a minute. Is that Who Would True Valour See? Or even all who would, all who would fallacy. Oh dear, we're already in trouble and we haven't even moved beyond the first line. <laughs> Who Would True Valour See is of course rooted firmly in our literary culture coming as it does from John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress first published in 1678. Bunyan's story is as we know an allegory bold and imaginative in its conception. As it stands in Bunyan's books 
who would True Violets see would seem perfect to inspire our singing. But how did Percy Dermer deal with it when he included it in the English Hymnal in 1906? He was the hymn book general editor and felt some concerns about borrowing the text directly from Pilgrim's Progress. Later, he explains in Songs of Praise Disgust, his aim was to meet a desire to include cheerful and bizarrely manly hymns. This, it seems, he achieved by changing the first word from who to he, in what some people may regard as an aggressive use of a masculine pronoun. Immediately we counter, encounter one of the most divisive subjects concerning older hymns, that of gender inclusivity. Is it in the 21st century appropriate to sing a hymn which explicitly excludes half the human race? Perhaps whilst He Would Valiant Be is a vintage hymn on the grounds that it is familiar and well loved, but now that we're thinking more critical of our choices, should we lay it aside? As we acknowledge that there are difficulties in cont continuing to use inappropriate gender words to refer to a person whose gender is unknown. Naturally, there's universal agreement that when a person's gender is known, i.e. St Peter or Mary the Mother of Christ and so on, the relevant pronoun is not under debate. The difficulty arises when a gender pronoun is used for a person whose gender is unknown. In the case of he who would valiant be, this could well exclude half the people singing. The problem is that English does not possess a pronoun for referring to a person of unknown gender. It, of course, is not used to refer to a person except in a derogatory way. Therefore, the tradition has been to use the word he for the want of a better word. This practice can cause offence, hence the growing trend for using plurals, they, them, their, and of course, all, to refer to people of unknown gender. Although a useful tactic, as we shall see, it can cause some headaches for hymn writers and editors. As an aside, even more problematic is the use of strictly inappropriate gender words to refer to groups of mixed gender. Using brothers and brethren to refer to a group of people that certainly contains women is highly objectionable to many. However, not all attempts to correct gender bias lead to the improvement intended. James Philip Macaulay's text, for example, after a unison refrain, opens with the lines, men are the sons of God and therefore brothers, and has been variously rewritten with some odd results. The original appears in With One Voice, yet in Baptist praise and worship, the fault, to my mind, is compounded as the line is improved to read, we are sons of God, sister and brother. Mercifully, in hymns and psalms, the line has been successfully reworked. Sisters and brothers, we are God's children, which neatly eradicates any suggestion of gender bias without offence to logic or good taste. What then shall we do about he who would valiant be? Obviously, the words could be adjusted, and this is exactly what has been done by the publisher Kevin Mayhew towards the end of the 20th century, giving us the opening line, all who would valiant be. This change, trivial as it seems, could have an unexpected and far-reaching consequence. It could be argued that such a small change does not significantly alter the content or flavour of the hymn. Simply changing he to all may be deemed to be an exact equivalent, but others may disagree. On a practical level, whilst attention has been paid, paid to maintaining the feel of this text, singers may be wrong-footed and stumble over the unexpected word. A striking example of such a change is the well-known Christmas hymn, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, which in some newer hymn books has been altered to God rest you merry gentle folk, whoever they may be. Perhaps some might argue this piece of tinkering, whilst undeniably gender inclusive, 
renders the text puzzling, puzzlingly unfamiliar. Yet another reason which makes all who would valiant be a less happy choice than he who would valiant be brings us to the vital part played by hymn books when we choose our hymns. If we embark on a wholesale revision of hymn texts to reflect current sensibilities, what does this mean to previously used hymn books? And does it mean they are consigned to the scrap heap, since they may contain unsuitable versions of our, our vintage hymns? Since hymn books play so, so often play a central part in worship, it's worth pausing to consider what a hymn book might actually represent to the congregation for which it was intended. It is true many churches have moved away from using hymn books in favour of screens, but for some, the printed word remains an essential part of the singing experience. Hymn books or hymnals fulfil many purposes. For many denominations, particularly non-conformists, the hymn book represents a vital liturgical resource second only in importance to the Bible. All worshipful worshipping communities would recognise the place of the hymn book as a teaching tool, able to communicate biblical truths with clarity and economy. Furthermore, the presence of a hymn book can be a source of comfort in difficult times. What can we learn about the fact that a hymn has been published in a hymn book? If the hymn's been published before, it indicates that the author and publisher think that it will appeal to its intended audience of singers, insofar that it will serve a useful role in their worship. This was Dilma's plan for who would true valour see, even if he felt that changes needed to be made. However, if a hymn has already appeared in, in print and is to be published yet again in a new hymn book, this is a clear indication of its enduring popularity. This is amply borne out in He Who Would Valiant Be. According to Hymn Quest, it is included in 54 hymn books. So the appearance or disappearance of a hymn from a hymn book provides a useful measure of how a hymn has been received by different generations of singers. Hymn books, though, are themselves very durable and the hymns they contain are sung by the purchasing community for years without making the, without the need to make any further payments. The huge financial outlay of furnishing a whole group with individual books is not undertaken lightly and it is usual to find churches or schools that have not replaced their regular volume for many years. Whilst it's very comforting to sit in the pews, leafing through an aged hymn book, remembering all the previous hymn, hymn singers who have used it, some obvious difficulties arise if we continue to use old books. The chief drawback is the inevitable conservative nature of any collection and the fact that some of the hymn text may, with the passing of time, start to express ideas opinions and attitudes to which the current singers are no longer willing to sub subscribe. It's also worth stating that once a text appears in a printed hymn book in whatever form the publisher thinks fit, it is fixed there for future generations to sing, as we can see from He Who Would Valiant Be. This can make choosing our hymns with care frustrating because using a dated hymn book is limiting for those wishing to sing newer material or hymns that have been changed with current sensibility or hymns that have been changed in keeping with current sensibilities. It's worth noting that many contemporary hymn writers, including Elizabeth Cosnett, Janet Wooten, Brian Wren and Fred Kahn, have all at some stage altered their own texts to reflect changes in their thinking. Whilst these changes appear in newer hymn books and resources such as HymnQuest, of course, 
those singing from older books will not be singing the hymn in a form its author currently favours. The publisher Kevin Mayhew made his choice with all who would valiant be. Let us now return to Derma's text to consider how some of his choices may affect whether we feel able to select the text with a clear conscience. One of his objections to the original text was that he felt it would be unacceptable to sing the word hobgoblin on the grounds that it does not appear in the Bible. Hold on, let's think about that for a minute. From a purely linguistic point of view, this seems a questionable point since the Bible is a translation and so no English words appear in it. Declaring that it would ensure disaster, as Derma put, said, to include these mythical creatures. Nevertheless, he remains content to keep the giants of the first verse on the grounds that giants are mentioned in the Bible. Musing on this point, I conclude that Derma subscribed to the belief that God is surely an Englishman. Perhaps, after all, the Bible was written in English. Perhaps he's like the Padre in J.G. Farrell's The Siege of Krishnapur. He could not understand why the Bible should have been translated at all, even in the first place. Why should it have been written in Hebrew and Greek when English was the obvious language? English was spoken in every corner of every continent. While Sturmer cannot be charged with making any specific reference to the superiority of the white races in He Who Would Valiant Be At Least, it's worth setting his hymn in cultural and historical context. Essentially a Victorian, it's unlikely that he would not have been touched by the strong pull of the empire so prevalent during the reign of Victoria. Many of our vintage hymns date from this time when hymn books frequently contained a section of national hymns. And this is testament to the expression of patriotic fervour which is apparent in Victorian hymns. Whilst he who would valiant be is not included in the national section of the English hymnal, I think it's important to include a brief mention of this subject in any study of Victorian hymns in the 21st century. A lazy approach to selecting hymns from this time may lead unwittingly to choose a hymn associated with patriotism and the British Empire, concepts to which we may no longer wish to subscribe. In the summer of 2020, there raged a fierce debate about the inclusion of certain items in the last night of the proms, with strong opinions on either side. At its most basic, the two opposing factions were divided between tradition, i.e. we've always done it this way, and the desire for revision, i.e. These texts as they stand are no longer appropriate. It's easy to see this debate in older hymn books. It's easy to see in our older hymn books that God favoured Britain over other nations. This debate mirrors the recent controversy over public monuments that celebrate the lives of people whose achievements are no longer admired and indeed are now positively reviled. In He Who Would Valiant Be, there is a whiff of the idea that Britons were called upon to lead pious lives and to ensure that they were worthy of the honour and power bestowed upon them. A suspicion encouraged by the fact that it's included in the public school hymn book of 1949. It's fair to say, though, that Derma focuses on the good life of the Christian in his hymn and avoids any assumption that Britain enjoyed some superior status. This is quite other in many Victorian writers. In God Our Fathers Known of Old, for example, by Rudyard Kipling, there's a clear warning that any loss of self-control by the British race would result in behaviour typical of lesser breeds. 
Certainly many hymn singers today will find this stance absurd and offensive, which may explain why Kipling's hymn has not been included in a hymn book since 1960, coincidentally the year after which many countries were granted independence from Britain. But we've come a long way from our hobgoblins and it's to these foul fiends that I now wish to return. Dilma does not take into account the variety of fears felt by Christians at the time of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. In his excellent book, At Day's Close, Roger E. Cook devotes a chapter to discussing the terrible danger the fairy folk and other malign spirits posed for people, especially during the hours of darkness. Indeed, darkness was Satan's unholy realm on earth as he waged perpetual warfare in the kingdom of Christ. His armies included a hierarchy of demons, imps, and yes, hobgoblins, all as real to contemporaries as Satan himself. As late as 1693, some 15 years after Pilgrim's Progress was published, the jurist Matthew Hale wrote about the operations of the evil angels. Beneath beliefs in the nightly terror of the supernatural were starting to wane by the beginning of the 18th century, partly because of practical improvements to daily life, such as better street lighting and the protection afforded by a professional police force. However, it's surely understandable that such threats continue to find expression in contemporary writers. Perhaps it's much the same as the desire for the protection in the Valley of the Shadow of Death of the 23rd Psalm. I think that Derma was in fact being careless in his casual jettisoning, jettisoning of deep help beliefs that persist, though rarely acknowledged. It could even be, be thought that explicit reference to dark spirits personified by imps and hobgoblins rather than being exercised from hymns, should be more deeply explored. But that's for another lecture. For today, thankfully, our hobgoblins have been reinstated by editors in more recent hymn books. Hobgoblin or Balfin can daunt his spirit He knows he at the end shall So, as we avoid Acadia, we should check that we are not overlooking the beliefs of others, even if we think them to be trivial or stupid. So, is it possible for me to choose a vintage hymn without falling into this sin? Another of my childhood favourites is When a Knight Won His Spurs by Jan Strother. Although now less frequently sung, it appears in 21 hymn books, including some of the most recent. For me, it's the perfect text to feed and fire my imagination, but there are shortcomings I need to think about. As an aside, it's interesting to note that this hymn with its dragons and ogres was commissioned by Percy Derma to be included in Songs of Praise, married to the tune Stoey. The language of medieval battles complete with armour and coupled with virtues of gallantry and valour, may seem to have little place in our lives today. Yet, do not modern computer games encourage us to triumph over mythical beasts? And in our lives, are we not encouraged to tame our inner dragons? Clearly, when a knight won his spurs is an image inspired by the armour of God of Ephesians 6, 10-18. The hymn calls to mind the spiritual weaponry available to all Christians against the evils of the world. Can it, though, pass muster? The masculine pronoun of the first verse is exactly the gender stereotyping that has come under scrutiny in our hymns 
with the suggestion that it is men who are seen as uniquely suited to the tough life of a soldier and equipped for the responsibilities of leadership on the battlefield. Early in his text, though, in contrast, early in this text, though, in contrast to Durham as he who would valiant be, we learn that each of the knight's seemingly manly qualities are balanced by a softer counterweight. Not only was he brave, but he was gentle. Not only was he bold, but he was gallant. This is interesting, and it strikes a chord with the writing of Brian Wren, who in his book, What Language Shall I Borrow?, points out that the strength of the male is all too often contrasted with the meekness and frailty of the female. These qualities, according to Wren, are frequently downgraded or despised. This means that masculine specific language is used repeatedly in connection with the winning of the battle for salvation. However, Strava moves beyond he to I at the beginning of the second verse, meaning that I too can ride along into battle. To conclude, I'm aware that many of the ideas I've expressed in this lecture will not meet with universal approval. However, it's my hope that having opened the debate, rather than succumbing to dull sloth, we will all choose our hymns with care and imagination. Thank you. Well, Gillian, thank you very, very much. That was extremely thought provoking. And having kept an eye on the comments section, I can tell you that people have a lot of thoughts on the subject. So just to remind you that those viewers, uh, listeners who would like to expand upon what Gillian has said can purchase her book, which is available to buy now from the RSCM's web shop. So before we move on to the questions and answers, here is a very short message from the RSCM's director, Hugh Morris. I really hope you've enjoyed the lecture and will keep watching to join the Q&A session. The RSCM is very much alive and active, but we are an independently funded charity and we need your support. There are real costs involved and we need people like you to put their hands into their pockets to help. Please show your appreciation for today's lecture, either by donating, be that by text or online, or by becoming a friend or a member. All the details can be found on our website, rscm.org.uk. Thank you. And now it's question time. Though before we do get to the questions, I will just take this opportunity to let you know that the next lunchtime lecture is on Friday the 4th of March, at which point Martin Baker will be discussing the musical achievements of George Malcolm who was Master of Music at Westminster Cathedral from 1947 to 1959. Right, now we've had an awful lot of comments coming in, very thoughtful comments. Um, some of them aren't phrased as questions, but I'll, I'll read them out um, in, you know, to sort of spark discussion. And so Helen Watson says, I'm interested in the relationship between the words of hymns and the tunes. Familiarity with the tunes has a deep meaning but people need to be challenged to think differently. Um, and I think that goes really sort of to the heart of what you were saying, doesn't it, sir? Yes, um, and I think uh, choosing, choosing a hymn and then singing it to a different tune, for example, a tune if you go to a different church and you end up choosing the, the hymns and, and you, you unwittingly pick a tune that uh, is other than that familiar, you can end, end up in, in deep trouble with the congregation. Uh -huh. However, it's it really is interesting to sing a different tune. And in fact, some churches that I've uh, worshipped in actually ch change the tune in the middle of a hymn. So in a six hymn verse, for example, you may have two verses to one tune and then change for the third and fourth verses and then back again for the fifth and sixth and this does mean that you really have got to keep thinking you end up with different stresses you end up with um different ideas about where you're going to breathe the text may come to life in a completely different way 
So I would encourage you to think about different uh, tunes as well as different words. Yes, which I think some people uh, touched upon within the comments. We have one, one here from uh, Simon Hancock, who mentions the solution of putting new words to classic tunes and, and, and gives a very good example of Ali Barrett's uh, Hope for the World's Despair. Um, so we have further down, uh, John Woodhouse says, just as it, it is good to learn Bible passages and prayers by heart, so vintage hymns can be a wonderful source of prayer, which can be much needed in times of trial. Absolutely. And I think uh, we've all known over the last couple of years, particularly that time when we weren't able to sing at all, how wonderful it was to, to return to our, our, our favourite hymns. Um, also, of course, as we become older and maybe lose some of our um, mental skills for um, communicating with others, there's a lot of evidence to show that people do go on knowing their hymns um, and I've yeah. often been into um, nursing homes um, and uh, residential homes to, to do hymn singing with um, older members of the community and it is wonderful to have them singing along and the ones that we tend to think of the usual suspects like for example all things bright and beautiful away in a manger those faces light up and they sing again, meeting yeah. their old friends. So I think it is wonderful to, to return and, and, and join in communicating uh, these sort of real Christian truths together and, and they never go away. So that's a lovely, lovely comment. Thank you. Yes. Um, we have another comment here from Agatha, Agatha von Dosberg who writes, <clears throat> some hymns have been changed, but not always for the better with singing traditional hymns why would people take offense? They appreciate that they were written many years ago. So she says, perhaps, Gillian, the issue has just become too political. I think that that is true. And I think that that, that is one way of responding to changes. Mm. Um, I think though it is important, for me, it is important to, to, to keep these questions open. I wouldn't say that you would necessarily not sing a hymn, I'm encouraging you to think about it. So it could be that uh, you may want to draw people's attention to the shortcomings of a hymn. Mm. So, well, perhaps we wouldn't necessarily think about this like this now. Um, and just give that extra little bit of thought into why you're choosing. You could choose a hymn that may be particularly um, dated and, and, and use it to lead a reflection of some kind. Um, why not have a hymn reflection session um, instead of a, a Bible uh, session? Um, the songs of praise services, people love to have a songs of praise service and a good sing is a really great way of spending an evening. Uh, why not introduce some of these hymns and say, think about, well, do we think that now? Or are we just going to enjoy singing it anyway? If you go ahead and enjoy singing it anyway, then then that's fine. That's That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just thinking, let's just... Let's just think. Let's just think. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, to go back to what you were saying about uh, going into nursing homes and, and, and it, it touches upon the age of the congregation, which has also been mentioned in the uh, chat feed. That, of course, quite a few young people coming into church these days might not actually be familiar with some of these uh, vintage hymns. Anyway. Yes. Uh, well, that, that is true. And I think that that's why it's important to to keep singing them. Um, sometimes you you hear the expression, particularly round about Christmas, of oh, we're just going to sing the usual suspects. And I think it is very important to go on singing the usual suspects uh, because you, you, it, it's as RSCM members, um, it, we're, it's incumbent on us to keep these traditions alive. If we don't go on singing, um, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Um, once in Royal David City, it, it will get lost. So yes. it's important too. So, but, but, but think, think all the time. Why are we singing this? We're singing this to keep the tradition alive. We're yes. singing this so others can enjoy it. Um, so, so those are reasons for not being slothful too. Keep, keeping the tradition alive is, is equally valid. Also, some hymns that are particularly not in favour now may be useful to sing as historical 
yes. scholarly study. Um, and so, so that that's another reason we don't think that now, but we used to think it then. So, um, so, so that's another thought, thought, thoughtful process. Yes, absolutely. And Simon Hancock mentions within the feed that uh, it perhaps isn't that difficult these days to draw from a wide variety of resources, given given the you know the texts and technologies that we have available to us. Um, and I wonder what you think about the solution that I, I, I know some people adopt, which is um, not to alter well-known texts, but just to have a mixture of hymns at different points in the services that perhaps balance out um, ones that you might consider to be more or less inclusive, so that you would have hymns in there that employ great. I think I think that is 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 one solution. I think I don't think that that is a way round slothful choosing because. <laughs> I think there's every chance that the hymns that we think are so new and on trend, as it were, are just as likely to be um, enshrined something that we wish we didn't sing in a couple of years' time. So I, I still think even if we pick something um, uh, contemporary, there's no reason why that should um, last any more than the older hymns. And also things, if they take on new ideas like technology, for example, technology is changing all the time, new hymns um, may embrace more language of, of technology that um, is, is more sort of up to the minute. But of course, technology is changing all the time. So the language might be changing all the time as well. So it, it is hard to keep up. It's very hard to keep up with changing. Um, but I think it is nice to have a mixture. I'm greatly in favour of having a mixture of all sorts of different music. Keep singing everything different. Keep mixing. Indeed, a very good sentiment. And I think we'll go with one last sentiment to finish up because the time is nearly upon us. Uh, why does the church insist on excluding the female half of the human race and 90% of its congregation by using outdated and offensive language? Asks Janet Holland. It's not political correctness, it's just good manners. It is. It is good manners. It is good manners. And, we, and, we, and it is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think um, there's even hymns um, that suggest that, 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 that women are, are uh, chattels and, and goods. Um, it, it's, it's a really important thing. And I'm afraid <laughs> that it's all too often women who are sounding this, which of course is very difficult um, to, to, to make our, our point felt. Mm. Um, so the only, there's two things I'd just like to say. One is thank you very much to Brian Wren for all the fantastic work that he's done on the subject. And another thing that I heard um, in connection with um, removing statues of disputed um, uh, famous um, figures, figures of, um, of previous repute that have now been removed. And one of the comments that somebody made is, you, you walk past that every day of your life on your way to work or school. And I think that this is what um, increasingly uh, women and girl singers are finding. Uh, we are excluded. And not only are we excluded from the words, but we're actually excluded from the kingdom of God. We are actually not included in the fight for salvation. So it is a big thing. It's not a little thing. Um, so thank you, Janet, for banging the drum again. Yeah, I think that is a wonderful place uh, to finish up. So a massive thank you once again, to Gillian, for giving up your time today. Uh, it's been lively. It's been educational. And I have really enjoyed it. An hour well spent, I think. Uh, thank you. Before we go, I would like to remind viewers that you can access our website using the links on the YouTube page below where you can donate, find out about membership, which will include your annual subscription to Sunday by Sunday if you are having trouble picking hymns. Uh, don't forget to buy a copy of Gillian's book and please do consider donating. And remember to mark Friday the 4th of March in your diaries, the next of the RSCM Lunchtime Lectures. Goodbye. <laughs>